Welcome back everyone. Today let's talk about fishing tackle. A little more fun than, you know, some of the other conservation stuff that we talked about earlier. Uh, this is Unit 1, Section 2. And fishing tackle can be just absolutely awesome. Some people get Honestly, they're, they're more into the fishing tackle than they are into the fish, and that's absolutely, totally cool. Other people, these are just tools as a means to the end. This is what you use to catch fish. And they don't get terribly um, involved with it. Um, for basic fishing, you don't need a lot of tackle. This is one of the, the wonderful things about fishing is this is not an equipment intensive sport if you're keeping it simple. And one of the very simplest pieces of equipment is a spin cast rod and reel combination. Yeah, sorry for the poor photo right here. Um, a spin cast is was developed in probably right after World War II. Um, they are inexpensive, easy to use, and generally they work pretty well. Uh, there's few moving parts to them, and did I mention that they're easy to use? We'll see that in just a moment. You can buy a nice little spin cast outfit for 25 35 dollars sometimes even less than that if you go to any garage sale you will probably see three or four of these uh leaning up in a corner with cobwebs all over them you could have them for you know a buck a piece i've been to auctions where these things are, are sold by the dozens for for a ten dollar bill if you're just starting out, I would highly recommend a spin cast. If you are taking kids fishing with you, I would highly recommend spin cast. These are incredibly easy to operate. And generally, they, they, they do the job. Uh, there's a couple issues with them. Uh, these are not the highest quality uh, mechanical instruments that have ever been made. They do introduce some line twist into the, the, the line, so line management becomes a bit of an issue. Th that can easily be overcome by either catching a half a dozen fish and letting the, the, the line stretch out. Uh, itself. Uh, you can pre-stretch your line. Generally just pick this thing up and go fishing with it. It's it's that easy. You're not going to make real long cast with these but you're going to be able to cast and catch fish with them. That's what's important. Did I mention that they're easy to use? Hi everyone welcome back. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the spin cast reel. Remember the, the, the spin cast reel has the reel on top of the rod. The rod has this little trigger down below. The spin cast has this button. This could not possibly be any easier. You press the button, the line runs out. Simple as that. Spin cast is really, really good for people just getting into fishing. Maybe if you have kids or you're taking kids fishing, this is a great outfit to start with. To use the, the, the rod, I recommend start, starting to use a sidearm cast. Sidearm casts are generally much easier. You don't get in trouble as much with a sidearm cast and it, so just watch. I press the button, I bring the rod back, and make my cast. Once I start turning the crank, it engages the line and starts to bring the line on. One thing I like to do is to take my index finger and put it right under the line. Two reasons. Number one, if a fish hits and I don't see it, I can usually feel it. Number two, especially with spin casts, 
the line has to be under continuous tension to be retrieved. If you continue to turn the crank without the line under tension, you can end up with a bird nest in here. So to guard against that, I always have a little bit of tension on that line as I'm bringing it in. If you want to do an overhand cast, it is simple. Press the button, bring it back, and just as if you were throwing a baseball, softball, darts, whatever, at the point that you would normally release that ball, you release the button and the line goes out. Personally, I like the sidearm cast. I stay out of trouble that way. Another technique you can use with a spin cast is to press the button, release it, now you have full control of that line. You can use your other hand to control that line and make your cast. I find that I'm a little more accurate that way because I can control the precise time that I release the line. And remember, the line is going to go wherever that rod tip is pointed tension on the line as I reel back in and we're ready to go again. Couldn't be simpler. When you get a hit, you set the hook, well you just reel and the little winch in here brings the line in, brings your fish in and you can release them as we've talked about uh, previously. So there you go, a little spin cast great little outfit. Probably everyone should have at least one. You never know when your cousin's going to come over. Anyway, talk to you later. Okay, so now that you know more about uh, spin cast rods, um, let's look at the different sizes of rods and, and how they're, they're measured. If you pick up a, a rod and look near the, the handle, the, the butt end of the rod, you will see some printing on the uh, blank. And it will be something in the effect of a line weight right here and a lure weight. This is the way for the manufacturer to tell you what they think this rod is best suited for. Right over here you'll see usually two, sometimes three letters. This indicates that this is a medium heavyweight rod designed for line weight 8 to 17 pound. We'll talk a little more about that in a moment. It's designed to use a lure that weighs between 3 eighths and one ounce. If you saw a UL right here, that would indicate an ultralight rod, and the line weight would be probably like two to six pound, designed to use a lure weight of one sixteenth to three eighths. Uh, I just kind of made those things up, but. Uh, you, you get the idea. Right over here is the length of the rod and these two numbers I have no idea what those mean. So just about any rod that you pick up, any modern rod, uh, you'll, you'll has, have this designation uh, on the rod. It, it just lets you know what this rod is designed to to do. As far as care and feeding of rods, the one tip I can give to you is um, make sure that the rod is either in your hand or it is vertical. If you allow a rod to go into a horizontal position, it will usually get broken. And what I mean by that is uh, laying the rod on the ground. Now it's in a horizontal position and inevitably you or someone else is going to st uh, step on it. So if you're out, you're fishing, set the rod up on, you know, lean it against a tree, um, 
of bait buckets, something to, to keep that rod up and visible and uh, safe from harm. There's not a whole bunch of other maintenance issues with rods. They're, they're pretty easy keepers. Um, reels, read the instruction manual that came with a reel. That is absolutely, absolutely the most important thing. It will give you all kinds of good information in there. Um, uh, some reels need to be lubricated periodically. Others are, are, are you know, um, maintenance-free, so, you know, quote, unquote. Um, so, so just read that, that um, uh, documentation that comes with your rod. You can also use no rod, no reel, the good old fashioned cane pole. You can actually still buy these. You know, a lot of uh, hardware stores, um, uh, corner gas stations near, near fishing um, uh, locations. And these catch fish, in fact, there is kind of a, a modern high-tech version of the the old cane rod in uh, uh, crappie rods uh, uh, they tend to be 10 12 feet long and a very simple reel um, is what people were using you know 100 150 200 500 years ago and it still works especially if you have you know kids um, it works beautifully for them. It there's it's simple. There's a few, if any, mechanical parts. They don't have to manipulate very much, and they do catch fish. Okay, let's talk about uh, fishing line uh, for a moment. We in the modern world have the tremendous convenience of using monofilament, which is a fancy word for nylon. Prior to World War II, fishing line was made with uh, horsehair or silk or linen. And all of those are natural materials, you know, yay for natural materials, but they weren't terribly strong and they had a tendency to rot. So every time you went fishing, you had to dry your line that's a phrase that's not even spoken today i remember my uh, my grandfather answering a question i had of him at the uh, family camp up in in pennsylvania there were two posts out back of the camp that had a like a t-bar on top of them i thought they were clotheslines you know, for, for drying, you know, clothes outdoors. But they didn't have the the little eye hooks that you would tie a clothesline onto, and, which I thought was a little weird. And so I asked him about that, and he explained that those were not for drying clothes, but for drying fishing line. That back before the war, whenever you came back from fishing, you would take the line off of your reel, and you would stretch it, from one of the T-bars to the other T-bar and just loop it back and forth like that and let the line dry. Because if you put the line away wet, it would uh, mildew and rot. And so, I mean, can you imagine doing that today? Nah, it's just not going to happen. So during World War II, uh, DuPont Corporation uh, developed nylon. Uh, for the war effort, and after the war, um, there was this guy, his first name I think was Berkeley, um, approached DuPont and asked if they could develop, use this nylon to develop a, a fishing line, and all well, the rest is, is history. And nylon, uh, monofilament has some tremendous advantages. Number one, you don't have to dry it. Um, it's really inexpensive. If you think about it, you can buy, you know, three or four hundred yard uh, spool of, of line for very little money. It has good castability. It 
has what they refer to as a, a hand. Uh, it can be a little bit stiff, um, but it's very, very strong for, for the uh, uh, cross-sectional diameter. Whenever you're just starting out, I would recommend staying uh, with a, about a 6 to a 10 pound uh, monofilament. The size of line is determined by the breaking strength, the theoretical breaking strength of the line. So a 6 pound line theoretically would break with 6 pounds of weight added to it. 10 pound, you know, so on and so forth. Um, I said theoretical because then we get into knot strength. Whenever you're tying the line on to the hook, all knots weaken the breaking strength of a, um, of a line. We'll get into that more, more later. So let's talk about hooks now. Um, <clears throat> they make, oh, I don't know, three or four thousand different types of hooks. Um, we're only going to talk about two of them uh, in, in, this, uh, in this unit. Up here is the long shanked Aberdeen style hook. This is what, if you think of a fish hook, this is what you're, 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 you're thinking about. Um, uh, down here we have a, you know, it's called a, a J hook. And this style has been around for a few centuries. It has an eye up here and a shank and the bend of the hook, the barb, and the, the point. Standard fishing fish hooks. These are particularly good if you're using, you know, like grasshoppers or crickets or minnows, um, worms. Yeah, they're, they're wonderful for, for natural um, uh, natural bait. Over here is something relatively new to the sport fishing market. I'm New to me is like 10 or 15 years. These are called circle hooks or sometimes referred to as octopus hooks. And they are quite different from the, the Aberdeen style. You notice that the point of the hook right here is perpendicular to the shank of the hook. And this causes a different hooking action with the fish. With the standard J style or Aberdeen style hook, the fish engulfs the bait. And the hook doesn't really do anything until the angler sets the hook. And what happens then is the, 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 the line is tightened, the rod is bent, and the hook is pulled back away from the fish. And as it's coming out of the fish's mouth, it snags on something inside of the mouth. Hopefully, you do this quick enough before the fish actually swallows the hook down in through the esophagus heading for the stomach. Well, that's not good news. The circle hook operates much differently. You have a baited hook. Let's say it's under a bobber. The bobber, you know, goes down once, goes down twice, and maybe starts to move off. The angler does nothing except pick up the rod and take out the slack from the line. As the fish continues to move away, the line tightens, which causes the hook to rotate, turn, and the point right here, which is perpendicular to the shank, gets embedded into the corner of the fish's jaw about 90% of the time. This is, in essence, a self-hooking hook. It relies upon the movement of the fish relative to the hook and the line, as opposed to relying upon the angler to do all the work. If you take kids fishing, this can be an absolute lifesaver. 
for those of you who have, who have fished, you, especially from an early age, you remember those, those traumatic experiences. Um, your, your uncle takes you out fishing and baits up the hook and either lets you cast or more than likely he cast out, handed you the rod and he told you to, you know, take up the slack. And so you, you do a couple, you know, turns of the, of the, um, uh, on the reel and you've got a nice tight line and a bobber is just kind of sitting there and uh, you as a little kid thinking this is actually kind of boring I'm just watching this red and white thing floating out there in the water oh geez oh look a butterfly at that moment a fish got interested in your bait and bites and starts to run and pulling the bobber underwater but you are looking at the butterfly and your uncle is pay attention pay attention watch your watch your bobber so you redirect your focus back onto the bobber and it's just sitting there it's like what and you're watching a bobber and you're watching a bobber and nothing's happening and there's that butterfly again at the exact moment, the fish reattacks the bait, and the barber goes down again. And your uncle is flailing his arms, yelling, Set the hook! Set the hook! Well, he never actually explained to you what set the hook means. And he grabs the rod, and he gives it a big pull, and the fish is long gone, taking the bait, and the barber comes whizzing back, you know, at you. Um, yeah, this fishing stuff is real fun, you know, Uncle. Um, circle hooks are much different. You take the kid out fishing, you bait a hook, you let them cast if they can, else you do it and you sit there and you watch the bobber and a butterfly comes by and now you're watching the butterfly and the uncle is watching the bobber go down and pop back up and the butterfly is coming over and it's landing on the flower and oh wow that's really cool look at the butterfly and the bobber goes down again and starts to, to move off to the side and then pops back up and the butterfly comes over and your uncle says hey you might want to check your check your line there just just pick that up and give it a, a few cranks and you pick up the rod and you give it a few cranks and whew, whoa something moved hey, you may have a fish. Reel that in a little bit more. And you start to reel more, and then you feel the, you, there's a fish on the end of the line. Oh, my gosh. And then the excitement of, of, of catching a fish just, just overwhelms you and takes off, and you're a lifelong fisherman, and you spend thousands and thousands of dollars on gear, and you buy a you know bass boat for $40,000. And uh, I'm sorry, I digress there. Um that is the fishing experience that we hope people have and circle hooks can cause that because they are in essence self-hooking uh, wildlife biologists love these things have a much uh, lower mortality rate than um, uh, aberdeen style j hooks they're not terribly popular and that means that they can be a little difficult to find sometimes You'll find 10 J hooks for every circle hook, maybe even 20 J hooks for every circle hook. So if you can find those, I do encourage you to, uh, to try them out. They are a different style, a different way of fishing. Hook sizes. This can be really confusing. Hooks are, are sized from 1 to, I think, 28 is the smallest hook I've ever seen. You, you need like a magnifying glass to, to see it. They're also sized from 1 through, in this illustration, 5 aught. And it's not 5 over 0. It's referred to as 5 aught. No idea how they did this numbering scheme. So, suffice to say, the larger the number, the smaller the hook. 
So this is a number one right here, and this is a number 22. Very, very, very small. And this is about actual size. That's about the size of a, of a, of a 22. For panfish, for bluegill, uh, you're going to be using between about a, a number 14 up through a number 6. Sometimes maybe a number 4 if you're going over, uh, going after some of those real big bull uh, bluegill um, that are going deep. A rule of thumb is that if a f the fish keeps stealing your bait... In other words, they're, they're taking the bait, your bobber's going under, uh, but you're just not able to hook the fish. Uh, reduce the hook size. That probably means that you're into a mess of, uh, of uh, bluegill that are too small to actually take the hook or the bait into their mouth. So if you go from a 6 down to like a 10, uh, you'll probably start catching a whole bunch of fish. Conversely, if you're catching a whole bunch of fish and that are small increase the hook size and you'll start to kind of weed out those 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 smaller smaller fish for largemouth bass uh, you'll be using about a um, uh, six up through a four aught catfish you know uh, two up to it through a four aught the larger the fish you intend to catch the larger the hook that you're going to to use okay let's talk about um, uh, weight typically whenever you're using uh, bait to catch bluegill or catfish or whatever you're going to add some weight to the line the standard weight is these little uh, split shot weights that are very very easy to use um, they're usually sold in a uh, container like this where you get several different sizes in, in, in one you know handy uh, dispenser they have a split down the middle and then these little wings right here and they're just crimped over the the line um, I recommend that you have a, a, a multi-tool with you something that has like a pliers um, uh, feature and you can just crimp these down over the uh, the line these little wings are used to take the weight off the line so these are, are reusable um, I don't recommend you just you know drop these into the water um, these wings are not designed to be used with your teeth uh, how much weight do you use um, as much as you need and no more there's kind of this fine dance between castability and sinkability and if you're using a bobber um, you want the bobber to float and if you have so much weight on here that it's literally pulling your bobber down you either need to go to a larger bobber or uh, to, to, to less weight Speaking of bobbers, um, everybody is probably familiar with these uh, red and white uh, bobbers. Spring-loaded, very easy to use, very effective. They've been around for decades and decades and decades. My favorite is actually the stick bobbers, just because I think they're cool. Um, these are actually a little um, older style. These have been used for probably centuries uh, because most people would make these could use a a, a stick and uh, a cork from from an old bottle and you would just basically tie it on to the end here and with a simple knot and that was your your bobber now there's this little spring down here uh, and a slot that you can put the line in very easy to use um, i'm also rather partial to the uh, spongebob square pants bobbers um, when the kids were, were were little and we were fishing a lot um, we went through quite a few uh, sponge spongebob um, uh, bobbers so that kind of wraps out wraps up what we refer to as terminal tackle these are the things that go on to the end of of, of the line um, 
there's a few accessories that you might find helpful. The number one accessory on my list is a pair of forceps. Right up here, these are the same forceps that are used in doctor's office, operating uh, theaters um, that's used to, you know, stitch you up, you know, perform intricate, you know, brain surgery, that type of thing. You can find these at uh, hardware stores, uh, big box stores, Menards, Lowe's, uh, uh, Harbor Freight, in, in the hardware section. I think an essential piece of equipment for fishing because it makes de-hooking fish so much easier. You catch the fish, you're holding the fish, you take the forceps, put it down into the fish's mouth, grab the shank of the hook, and just with a little bit of a twist, you can disengage that barb and pull the hook right out. No more stuffing your great big fat sausage fingers down into the mouth of this little tiny bluegill and you know watching his tail go back and forth. No, none of that. Use a pair of forceps. Your life will be much happier. The fish's life will be much happier. Um, you need some type of a line nipper. Uh, this can be as simple as a pair of fingernail uh, clippers, you know, kind of dual duty. They do make line nippers in the fishing industry. This costs 79 cents, um, uh, a fancy pair of line nippers uh, you could spend $25 on. Guess what? Both of those will sink to the bottom of the lake just as fast. So, Spend your money wisely. Uh, of course, you're going to want some place to keep all of this stuff. So a tackle box would be a good idea. A tape measure is important because some species, largemouth bass, have a size uh, requirement. Uh, largemouth bass, if, if, if you remember, was 14 inches uh, caught in a lake and 13 inches caught in a, uh, a river or stream. And you need to... to be able to determine that uh, somehow. If you are taking uh, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, uh, cousins fishing, uh, the neighborhood, uh, the, the neighbor's kid uh, fishing, which I, I, I highly encourage you to do. There is nothing, literally, fishing is more fun with kids. Take a, get a five gallon bucket and, and take that. Um, it just has multiple uses. You can, you know, shove things into it, uh, carry things, uh, unruly kids, lunch, you know, water bottles. They're, they're just real handy. Uh, they, they make a, a fancy lid uh, that you can use as a, as a tackle box right there with the, uh, the bucket. I found that when fishing with kids, fill this bucket full of water, and whenever you catch a fish throw it in a bucket and the fish is going to swim around in a bucket and the kids are going to be absolutely mesmerized and it's a wonderful educational opportunity so that the, the kid can see this fish up close they can stick their hands in the water and they can touch the fish um, they will entertain themselves for minutes doing this uh, multi-tool uh, or, or wire cutter I, I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I think a multi-tool is a much better uh, option than the, uh, the wire cutters. Uh, of course, you're going to need the, the normal requisites, uh, bug spray, sunscreen. Uh, you'll have your cell phone with you whenever you catch that, that world uh, record, um, you know, 28-pound largemouth bass. Uh, you'll have your cell phone there that you can take a picture of it. And you'll have a tape measure to take measurement. And also some type of a basic first aid kit. Um, this is something that can float around in the bottom of the, of the five gallon bucket. So there you go. Those are the things that you need for a, a basic uh, fishing outfit. Um, we'll talk about how to use all of these things in the, in the next lecture. So, I really want to impress upon you that you don't need to spend a lot of money here. Fishing, by its very nature, is designed to um, 
uh, to be inexpensive. In fact, there's an entire genre of fishing uh, referred to as survival fishing. You know, how to go out into the woods uh, with nothing and, and catch a fish. Interesting, a lot of stuff on YouTube if you want to check that out. So, I'll see you in part two.